for the next hour on BBC World News. We're live from Davos in Switzerland for a special BBC World debate. And we're talking about a subject much on the minds of those here, inequality. After the financial crisis of 2008, many people hoped a more equal world would emerge, that we might see a fresh start, reform of the banks, a narrowing of the gap between rich and poor. But it hasn't quite gone to that plan. The richest 1% in the world not only have lots of power, they're said to still own nearly half the world's wealth. So today we're asking, a richer world, but for whom? I'm joined by our panellists, two leading policymakers, Christine Lagarde from the International Monetary Fund and Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England. We're also joined by two chief executives of companies with branches all around the globe, Sir Martin Sorrell and Klaus Kleinfeld. And also Robert Schiller, economics Nobel Prize winner, and from Oxfam International, Winnie Bianyema. But first, the latest news from David Eads in London. Two-minute news summary, then we're back. <laughs> yeah. OK. OK. Good, good. Thanks, John. I can't hear David Eads. You, you, you're just going to say Q, but it is David Eads, I'm hoping. OK. <clears throat> David, thank you. Well, welcome back to Davos. I'm Evan Davis. We're live for the next hour to ask whether, we all, whether we're all in it together at a crucial time for the world economy. Do the rich deserve their riches? Would any kind of reform improve things? And technology, is it entrenching economic power or dispersing it? Lots to talk about. Joining me here at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos. First, two policymakers who are both publicly accountable. Christine Lagarde, who's managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England. Uh, other panellists include Martin Sorrell, who's Chief Executive of the Global Advertising Group, WPP, Winnie Bianyema, Executive Director at Oxfam International, Klaus Kleinfeld, the Chief Executive of Alcoa, a global company in metals, technology, engineering and manufacturing, and Robert Schiller, who's Professor of Economics at Yale University and a Nobel Prize co laureate in economics. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our panel. Well, you can tell we have a large audience here with us of business, political and civil society leaders. We'll be taking comments as we talk from Twitter. So tweet your thoughts, whether you're in the room or out there. Use the hashtag BBC World Debate. Now, first, let's just get out of Davos, because we went onto the streets of India, Spain, Brazil and the UK to ask people out there what they feel about the gap between rich and poor. Here's what they told us. Well, I, I live well in my country, but I realize that there is a lot of uh, inequality and we have to improve the uh, opportunity to all. There's some people scraping at one end, trying to uh, just make a living and no more, and other people that have got enough money to go and buy paintings at half a million pounds. It's, it's, it's not fair. We all can see that uh, rich are going, uh, going to be more rich and poor are getting more poor. It is very frustrating. Obviously, we share the same planet, we share the same city, the same country. So equality should, should come with the kind of mentality, the kind of tradition, the kind of culture you're sharing, not with what area you put up in or what car you own. Inequality is, is raising because of two things. Unemployment, basically, a uh, huge um, amount of people unemployed and the, one, the ones who have uh, the, the opportunity to get employed um, they, they have uh, ridiculously uh, low wages. 
I think it's mainly the government, but I think it's also businesses too, rather kind of not locking into this old boys club of all the kind of top sort of elite people have, have all the opportunities. It's like actually opening it out to a much wider field. Also, the banks have not been transparent. Uh, probably the law regulations were not helping um, and governments definitely, and they've, they've uh, stolen a lot from the, from the people. Look at all the scandals that we can we hear about. If only this money could be referred to actual education, infrastructure, I mean, tra even transportation is a problem because kids can get to school, they can get to work. I think um, the, the government could uh, could levy the taxes a little bit better, that the, the rich should be taxed a bit more, and a bit of that should go to help the, the poorer people that they need it. Well, some public views there, raising many issues we'll get to in the next hour. And I think showing this is truly a world debate. Well, let's get a response first from two important policymakers. I think it's fair to say neither has a background that makes them cheerleaders for a revolution, but both have expressed some concerns with the direction the world has been taking. Christine Lagarde, let me start with you, because the International Monetary Fund used to be thought of as a giant force for conservatism. And then last year, a bombshell it published a report, a working paper, that said lower net inequality, that is more equality, is robustly correlated with faster and more durable growth, that you get more growth in a more equal society. It's a big change, right? Yes, it is a big change, and I'd, uh, I'll never forget the scepticism that I met when uh, two years ago, after having given a speech here, where I raised the issue of inequality and climate change. Some of my economists and quite a few of my um, board members around the table said, this is not mainstream, you know. This is not core <laughs> business for the IMF. And I have to say that now it is mainstream. And I was very pleased to see that many of the IMF economists actually embraced the project and produced several pieces of analytical research. And if I may, I would like to just mention three points that they made. Number one, what you just said, that is excessive inequality is not conducive to sustainable growth. Strong correlation. Number two, uh, they're finding that distribution per se matters. In other words, if you increase the income share of the poorest, you get a multiplying effect that you do not get if you increase the income share of the richest. So it is good for the economy. It is good for growth. There is a multiplying effect that you find in that uh, dimension. Third factor, redistribution policies are not counterproductive for growth, and that is not that was not conventional wisdom. It was generally accepted on the other, you know, to the contrary, that redistribution policy was not necessarily good for growth. So on these three fronts, they're saying, you know, inequality is not good for growth. Inequality, in my view, is not good for women because that's a particular inequality that I'm especially concerned about, uh, the gender inequality. Just give us what's underlying that. What is the reason why? very unequal societies can damage their own economic prospects? Well, you see the correlation between sustainable growth on the one hand and high and increasing inequality. But why? Well, it's a factor of this multiplying effect that I have mentioned. Mm. Uh, it's a factor of uh, people not being integrated into society. And it's a factor, as one of the uh, persons, uh, you know, on, on your little film said, uh, jobs, jobs, right. employment uh, are critical uh, points to, to really okay. improve upon. We'll get a, uh, plenty of these, uh, to, plenty of time to follow up all of this. Mark Carney, uh, Governor of the Bank of England. Now, you warned in a speech last year, it's a pretty interesting line actually, just as any revolution eats its children, unchecked market funda fundamentalism can devour the social capital essential for the long term dynamism of capitalism itself. Just elaborate on that. Well, I think um, one of the things that's happened is that we went through a period in the run-up to the crisis where belief in market and market solutions extended to all most aspects of not just economic and financial policy, but many aspects of public policy. So the, the marketization, if you will, of, uh, of social policy, public policy. What was lost, and there was a lot of good in that, but what was lost in that was the importance of social capital. And this is something, this is not new. We need to recall the importance of social capital. Adam Smith to Hayek to others understood the importance of a shared set of beliefs and, and a sense of trust and shared value in the system. We'd undervalued that. 
it was masked for a period of time. I know you're going to talk about globalization and technology later, but globalization and technology magnify market distributions. And that was masked for a period of time through some good financial innovation, but also some misguided financial innovation, which allowed consumption to continue to grow, even though income didn't grow in pace. Robert Schiller drew attention to most of this. And the point being that, uh, in the words of one of my colleagues at the Bank of England, it was a, it was a policy of let them eat credit uh, for a period that masked these uh, differences. So we're in a situation where we've had to start to reinvest in that social capital to maintain the dynamism of capitalism, but to rebuild the trust in the system and reorient towards a longer term perspective. And hopefully we'll come to some of the measures okay, that well do that's that. A a very important statement of the kind of shift in the intellectual climate over the last few years. Well, we're dividing this debate into three sections. I'll introduce them as we go along. But to start off, I want us to talk about the rich. That 1% that own maybe half of global wealth, or even more importantly, that 0.1% who've done so well in recent decades. And for this first section, I want us to ask, what have the rich ever done for us? Ask yourself, do you think they put more into society <laughs> or take more out? Are they producers or predators? Obviously, your view on this will determine your view of inequality to some extent. Here, first of all, are two voices from business. Capitalism, better than any other system, enables people, as Lincoln put it, to improve their lot in life. People don't mind that the late, Bill, that the late Steve Jobs got rich or that Bill Gates has tens of billions of dollars. What people want is the opportunity, as Lincoln put it, to improve their lot in life. They have the opportunity to move ahead. When free markets are allowed to operate with sound money, sensible low taxes, sensible regulation, uh, people do move up. I think it's very important in all the debate about inequality that we do not demonize the wealth creators, uh, do not criticize them relentlessly as fat cats or as uh, the um, plutocrats, because I think that a society that uh, demonizes capitalism and wealth creation is doomed to a lack of investment and a leakage of talent and uh, will suffer the economic consequences of such an attitude. So two pro-rich views there and two propositions underlie the views we've just heard. First, that the rich, uh, that they do good to the world and second, that they need to be rewarded for that uh, or they may not do that good. Let's focus on those ideas, essentially of whether the rich give us value or not. And Winnie Bianyama, Bianyama, I want to come to you on this. Do you essentially see that 0.1% and Oxfam have made quite a lot of about their, their wealth. Do you see them as producers or predators? Of course, they are producers of wealth, uh, but the issue is about political capture, that extreme wealth takes over the process of public decision making. The rules of the market and the rules that govern society become skewed in favor of the extremely wealthy. And that's why you get unchecked, uncontrollable rise of inequality. Let me give you an example. In the United States alone, the financial lobbyists spent $400 million in 2013 lobbying, influencing political and economic decision making. They spent $571 million in campaign contributions in the 2012 election. Here in the EU, $150 million spent in lobbying the, the, the European governments and the European Union. This is about shaping the rules of the market in their favor. In an ideal situation, we would have all people shaping the way the economy is governed and society is governed. That is the problem, that extreme wealth results in political capture, and then from their own, public decision-making is in the interest of the wealthy. So wealth entrenches wealth, even if there's no merit to it. So Martin, sorry. I, I, um, I just want to get a little bit more balance into the debate. And we got, we had Steve, I don't know whether Steve Orbs is balanced or not, but <laughs> we had that, Luke is more bal balanced. So I, I make no apology for having started a company 30 years ago with two people and having 179,000 people in 111 countries. 
and investing in human capital each year to the tune of at least $12 billion a year. So there's, I make no apology for that whatsoever. The other thing uh, I want to say is this. Over the last 40 or 50 years, we have seen significant improvements in the number of people that have been taken out of poverty, in the number of people that have been put into the middle class, and people use that phrase, and I find it somewhat objectionable how it is used, and the definitions, whether you look at the World Bank or you look at others, whatever the definitions are, but certainly billions of people in emerging markets, what we call fast growth markets, are in that, that class and have come into that class. Gini coefficients have improved significantly since 1960. These are the measures of, 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 of inequality. inequality. Since 2000, they've gone backwards, marginally, but they have significantly improved. And finally, it's not, it's not well publicized, even by organizations such as Oxfam, for whom we work, right? But in The Lancet, for example, <laughs> For in The Lancet, for example, uh, in the last 30 days, it'd be a very interesting article about the number of diseases and reduction in diseases and reduction in the years of lives lost, which has been very significant, again, in the last 40 or 50 years. So we have made improvements. The question is, have we made sufficient improvements? As we get into it, there are two things I just want to say finally. One is, the World Economic Forum, which Sam has done some very interesting work on what needs to be done in terms of categories to improve equality. By the way, Christine, it is not proven that equality, the reverse of what you said is true, that equality drives sustainable growth, e.g. No, Venezuela. Not, yeah, right. not what I the said. Second thing is, the second thing is, in terms of employment in the private sector, we are in a low growth trap. Companies are not increasing employment. We've talked about this before, Mark. There's a slow growth economy. There's too much focus on cost, not enough focus on expansion and growth. I take that. There's $7 trillion, to win his point, sitting on balance sheets un uninvested. I'm going to, Winnie, quick, quick reply to Martin. Yes. Yeah. No, honestly, since the financial crisis, we're seeing rising inequality. The gap between the rich and poor is widening very fast. Last year, we issued a report Oxfam issued a report that said that 85 richest people in the world own as much wealth as the bottom 50%. This year, the figure has come down to 80. The rate of growing inequality is Winnie, high. That's because and, the bottom, the bottom and wait, very large number of people own nothing at all. So if you compare know, wealth of people who have nothing, so, people so, who even have a tiny bit of wealth have more than the bottom 20%. And so of in, wealth in human capital. Yeah, so it, that's another yeah. thing. But, but so, look. And we know the reasons. We know the reasons. We know that many wealthy companies and individuals are not paying their fair share of taxes. There's a global tax system that's leaking. We need to fix that. Look, we I want to go to back to our two chief executives here because Winnie made a very important point, and we've had it on Facebook too, Ian Charlton from Australia. The rich make the rules. He says they pay less tax. They own the media. They influence elections. Uh, so we need to get rid of them. It's a sentiment, <laughs> sentiment plenty of people have. But look, I don't know one, of the, one, of the, one of the interesting areas. I wish we did. But one of the interesting the areas. One of the interesting areas where inequality that has driven some in growth in, in inequality in developed countries has been growing chief executive salary. Now, isn't this an area where the rich make the rules and then pay themselves a lot? So, Klaus, I want to ask you a very specific question. You've got a great job, right? And you're paid handsomely. Yes. Would you do that job for half as much? I don't know. I never intended to in my life to to become a CEO. I mean, my life got me there, and uh, and uh, apparently people thought I'm good at that. Uh, but uh, can I actually go back because I got some numbers here? No, because I, I think I think it's important that we are not throwing out the baby with the bathtub. Because I think the, we are kind of uh, tempted to debate it in the current context, but in reality, I think we have to analyze the data and the facts. What I, and I looked it up uh, for this debate. What Martin just said, the global emergence of poverty. I mean, people live, being li uh, uh, living in poverty, the share of the world population living in poverty. 1820, 94% have been living in poverty. 1950, 72%. 2011, which is the last number I could get hold of, 14.5%, yeah. right? So middle class, defined by $3,900 per purchasing power parity. In 1820, 2% of the world's population were in that category. In 1950, 23%, right? In 20 to, uh, 2010, 
54 percent. I, I want think, us to I come think, to that, but I do want, about, I do want to I, just no, ask I'm talking, about the, the, I think the we're rich talking about a recent phenomenon, and I think we have to be careful to analyze it as a recent phenomenon. And I think we have to stratify it with the time frame of a recency and think what happened there. What changed in this enormous wealth creation that we have been generating through basically industrialization and, and, and globalization. And the second thing is, it's very different. That We have to be careful that the debate is not focused just on the West, but also on the rest. Because I think we're seeing very different phenomena. Also, when you talk about measures, what's happening in the Western world and what's happening in the rest of the world. Three would answer, pay for performance, Evan. Right. That, come and back to the CEO question. Pay for performance. If it's pay... Is there pay for performance? Yes. Yes. I mean, okay. 90, Robert Schiller, 90, I, want to, 90, I do want to bring Robert Schiller in this case, a Nobel yeah. Prize winning economist. But comment on what you've heard so far, the proposition. The inequality problem has been around for millennia, and there have been efforts to deal with it. Tithing is in both the Muslim and Christian religions. There's, there's a lot of history to this. It's a complicated problem. As you were I'm hearing at different sides here. As you were saying, the rich can dominate and they can be obnoxious sometimes in defending their interests. On the other hand, we have to give incentives to, to and you are, Klaus are exactly right. The capitalists, you're not the first person to make this observation. It's known all <laughs> over the world. That's why a lot of formerly communist countries are embracing market solutions. Correct. And I assume you agree and basically, so it's a subtle problem that we have. Of, of trying to create rules and institutions that and I bet you'd do it for half the money, by the way. You see, this <laughs> is the point. <laughs> see, I, I, I think I you'd do it. I wouldn't necessarily place that back China. <laughs> come back, come back, come back. China, China <laughs> is state-directed capitalism. The Absolutely. Chinese, ironically, paradoxically, have chosen a system, post Deng Xiaoping's famous speech in 1985, to stimulate the growth of the middle class through state-directed capitalism. Mark yes. Carney, so let me just bring Mark Carney. Mark Carney, yep. I mean, you work for Goldman Sachs and we're handsomely paid there, I'm sure. What, what is, do we pay? <laughs> is, there a, is there a feature of the world that means that we're more keen to cut costs for people at the bottom of the spectrum than people at the top of the spectrum? I, I, there, there are technological dynamics, which we'll get to, I think, later on, which are keeping lower skilled wages um, flatter than they would otherwise be. Okay, um, so I think we should recognize that. Let me make a couple points. First, this, this uh, point about reduction in poverty, absolutely essential, um, hugely important, but that is a global, that, that is a process of global globalization and its convergence across countries. That's good news. In virtually every country, including those countries that are growing, those big emerging markets, inequality is increasing, uh, and increasing quite dramatically. So this issue is an issue. It's as much an issue in China mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. it is in the UK, for example. Um, and in terms of this, these questions around um, uh, the structure of wages and where, um, where opportunity is found um, to reduce costs, the returns to skills <laughs> are magnified in a globalized economy. Steve Jobs' brilliance is applied globally um, as opposed to locally. And that changes the returns and those who, those who work within the skilled jobs there. And so you, we recognize those dynamics. We should just recognize those dynamics. There's nothing wrong with those dynamics. But then the question comes and you know, the, the common theme of your uh, interviews on the street uh, is about equality of opportunity or opportunity for all, when one man put it. And so it's how within this structure and as the system evolves, do you maintain that equality of opportunity? Christine, Winnie made a stronger point though, which she was saying that the rich set the rules, implying that they are somehow over rewarding themselves by setting the rules for what they had uh, delivered. Now, do you believe that or not? You have different forces here. Uh, and, and I think the answer will, will depend on whether you're in a democratic environment where people have a voice, have a vote, and where it is counterbalanced by this excessive uh, power of conviction that is not in the ballot box but in the wallet. Right? So all these has, you know, has to be looked at on, on a, on a per-democracy or per-other regime mm -hmm. basis. That's one. Second, I confirm what I said, Martin. It's, I didn't say that equality is conducive to growth. Mm. I said excessive inequality exactly. is not uh, good for sustainable growth. That's mm. what our research mm. um, 
uh, indicates. But I think we, we should also look at what can be done about it, because there has been a worsening of the situation, particularly since the financial crisis. And uh, we have to look at why that is. We're going to do and that in a minute. We're going to okay, come to the... OK, but if I can just the, yeah, say you know, why that is. You have had a massive increase of wealth caused by an increase of the asset prices under the current circumstances. So I think we have to distinguish between the income disparity, the wealth disparity, and for each of those two, we need to think about what can be done about it in order to reduce the excessive inequality mm -hmm. that hamper growth, that hamper jobs, and that prevent women from accessing the economy. Just to finish this section, Winnie, I want to ask you the question, the Steve Jobs question. Mm -hmm. If all that 0.1% were kind of Steve Jobs 1%. type characters, mm -hmm. Well, Steve Jobs was more than the top 1%. Uh, if, if they were all Steve Jobs type people, would you feel any problem with global inequality and, the, and, and that, that busload of people who own as much as half the world? OK, when we put out these statistics, we, we, we are trying to show how, a trend. We are not trying to say that this 1% or 0.1% are the bad guys to focus on. This is not about who flew in here on a private jet and who did not. What we are talking about is that the very wealthy all over the world can buy for themselves longer, healthier, happier lives, while poor people at the bottom are trapped and their children are trapped in poverty for generations. If you take the level of inequality as it exists now in the United States, for example, a child born in a poor family will become a poor adult. So the American dream is just that, a dream. It's not true because of the level of extreme in of inequality. So what we're talking about here is that there are solutions, and we want to focus on those solutions, the things that have worked, that reduce economic And we're going to do that now. Look, what we've seen so far is this is it's quite hard to trap people into binary position on the, uh, <laughs> the, value of the, of the value of the rich. But I do just want to do a show of hands in this audience, which could probably not be less typical of the world uh, outside. <laughs> but uh, I do want to just to get the sort of the mood of the meeting. Look, let's just do a little sort of show of hands of whether you think that the top 0.1% are net contributors to the world they're kind of, if you like, the Steve Jobs types, or whether they're net extractors. They're very clever people who invent spurious financial products and take out very high salaries. How many of you here would say they're net contributors? How many of you would say they're net extractors of value from... OK, I would say that was about nine... Uh, eight to one in favour of, uh, of the contributors. So the uh, mood of this meeting, that they are net contributors. Well, look, let's move on. Everyone's been saying we need to talk about what we do about it. And as we've heard, for all the gloom about inequality, global capitalism has been doing something right. It has been lifting people out of poverty. According to the World Bank, the proportion of the world living below $1.25 a day uh, has gone from 36% back in 1990 to 15% today. So you might ask, do we need to reform that system? Well, we asked one laureate of the Nobel Peace Prize, Mohammed Yunus, He's the man credited with inventing microcredit. Why we should care about reform. Nothing has changed before the 2008 crisis and after the 2008 crisis. We only took time to get back to the same old thing that we left behind in 2008. So we are back in pre-2008. Institution didn't change. Policies didn't change. Nothing has changed. Uh, that's a sad thing because we thought this financial crisis will teach us a lesson that we have to redo things. We didn't redo things. We are talking about banking system, financial system is very much biased towards the rich people. So as a result of the way human being has been interpreted in the economic theory, uh, economic uh, structure that we built around us became a sucking machine. All it does, suck juice from the bottom and transport it to the top. So that's unacceptable, and it will get worse. It will not get better. It will become a big, big crisis. The whole society will explode at one time, seeing what has happened. All the wealth of a nation, any nation, will be in the hands of a few people, and other people will be just lying there 
trying to struggle for make ends meet. That's not something we have learned from 2008. So now we have to go back and redesign the system. There's no option than doing that. The views of Mohammed Yunus there. We actually had a tweet uh, from Eric Prennan. He says, you can debate the numbers all you want. People perceive the world as being unequal, so not solving it mm. will spark social unrest. So what do we want to uh, do about it? Let's have a think about reform and whether it will achieve much. This is a chance to talk about tax and similar issues. Um, take us away. How radical would you be, Bob Schiller? Well, I've written four books <laughs> about this. And I view these as complicated problems. First of all, who are we? Muhammad Yunus referred to we. Are. There's, there's a fundamental thing called civil society. And it has developed. It, it, it's not entirely. You, Winnie, you're right that, but we, about unequal power. But we still, and I'm not sure if we all understand how it works, but even the rich can be shamed out of pursuing it too much. Um, ultimately, we do campaign law. Somehow these things happen. They're not perfect, but we move ahead. But now, do you want me to talk about my particular proposal? I, th I think that it is so complicated, and there's such a long history. I, I think we should be generally happy that inequality is not worse. Uh, and, 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 uh, but, but we can, I think you're right, Winnie. Oxfam is doing a good thing to draw attention to these problems. So can I, what, where, I could How go radical would you be? How <laughs> radical would you be in reforming the current global economic yeah. system? There's a, clearly yeah. there's some perception that it's not working for everybody. Well, I think I think of myself as a radical, but not in the communist side. <laughs> I believe uh, that it's a problem of economics. It's a problem of risk management. It's a problem of incentivization, and it's a political problem. Uh, so what I like to think of is going toward the concepts of the financial and economic theory and based on also our knowledge of human psychology and human instincts about fairness. People have very strong emotion. We have to design institutions. So, uh, give us an example okay, of something you, you would do. I'll give you two general categories right. that I talk about in my book. But, but they don't solve all the problems. The problem no, no, is so no, complicated. Just... One thing is improving private insurance. We have disability insurance. That helps. I want to give a, 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 ask for a appreciation of what insurance people do. Disability insurance is a huge factor of reducing inequality. Okay. We can improve disability insurance by making it cover livelihood risks of a much broader nature. And, okay. and that, the, <laughs> I wonder, Winnie, give us your manifesto. We've had, we've had one, one idea, and I just want to hear some ideas, and then we'll put them to our other. Global tax reform. Oxfam estimates that there's $18 trillion stashed out somewhere in tax havens that's not being taxed. That's money that could be plowed back in the economy to create jobs and to give opportunity to poor people, to lift themselves from poverty. So fixing the tax systems to reduce tax dodging and to tax progressively. That's one. We also know that giving a minimum wage lifts, reduces inequality significantly. Brazil did it. It increased the minimum wage by 50% between 1995 and 2011. That considerably reduced inequality and lifted people out of okay, poverty. Let's put, those both are those two our, right. let's put both those to our chief executives, okay. Klaus and, 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 and Well, and I, think what's, what, I think a bit of what's missing in the current debate is, I mean, we, the drivers. I mean, we're always referring to times, I mean, after 2008, as though nothing else has happened. In my view, what's missing in the debate is there is a gigantic new factor, and that's technology. And the way technology changes, changes the world in a, in, a, in, a, in a speed that we haven't seen before. It does good things, you know, for... Klaus, we're going to talk about... I just want the tax. Just answer the oh, specific the thing side. about... Well, I'm not the expert on the tax side, to be honest. You know, I leave it to, to, Martin, to the experts. Martin, you're an expert because you moved your company to Ireland when the tax rate got too high. Let, <laughs> now, wait a minute. Your, your poll just proved that turkeys don't vote for Christmas. <laughs> Second point, cheap, cheap money has driven the asset appreciation since Lehman in 2008. So central bank policy has driven... We got another dose of it yesterday. What happened? Our share price went up 3%. Did things change fundamentally? Was there structural reform in Europe? No. The third point is, 
When I left university many, many years ago, what was the fundamental tenet of economic policy? It was full employment. There was a thing called the Phillips curve, which said, what's the level of inflation at full employment? Today, it's the complete reverse. Six-point plan. And I take this quick, from quick, Rick, quick, Rick uh, Sam. Human capital, <laughs> i.e. education. Employment and labor compensation. Entrepreneurship and investment. Corruption and concentration of rents. Fiscal transfers, about equalization of taxation. And basic services and infrastructure, both hard and soft. That's it. Okay. Well, you've done, you've done the job that uh, we, uh, Jonathan Fearon from Jamaica asked you to do, which is he says he wanted to hear from the rich themselves how they would make it better for the poor. You've given us a lot to chew on. But you mentioned monetary policy driving it. I did want to ask Mark Carney, you were mm. a central bank governor, uh, firstly for a comment on what happened yesterday at the European Central Bank. And does the whole issue about quantitative easing, has that actually been playing part, some role in this, particularly the, the distribution of wealth? Well, all, the first thing, um, welcome the steps that the ECB uh, took yesterday, absolutely necessary to preserve the prospects of medium-term prosperity in Europe. But as Martin indicates, that this doesn't deliver medium-term prosperity. It just it, it creates the conditions for it, first point. Secondly, um, some of the necessary conditions. Um, secondly, all monetary policy has distributional consequences. We lower interest rates. It helps debtors at the expense of savers. Questions of distribution are rightly the province of elected governments. They're, 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 they're societal questions. They're not questions uh, for central banks. Third point, if I may. What's absolutely crucial is that we have inflation in the right spot. Inflation, need I remind you, hurts the poor more than anyone else. The poor use cash. They can't hedge themselves. They don't have access to any form of insurance. It hurts them more than anyone else. And deflation, which is one of the bigger risks at the moment, globally, will hurt those who are indebted, those who became indebted in the run-up to the crisis, those who didn't see their wages increase in the run-up to the crisis. That will make the weight of those debts that much worse. Um, so getting this right, whether it's the Bank of England or the ECB, um, in order to deliver one of the necessary conditions, ultimately, so that governments, society, civil society as a whole, can address these broader issues. OK. We have a window of opportunity. The price of oil has gone down significantly and probably for a period of time. Now is the time to actually remove the world over the subsidies to use of energy. You have dormant there $2 trillion if you include the uh, sort of damage caused to the environment as a result of extensive use of energy. So, you remove those subsidies, two trillion, you put one trillion on job creation, that is you reduce the social charges on job creation, so you accelerate that, and you put one trillion on education, and you particularly focus on women. Two trillions available, you split them in half. Other option that you can also consider, as well as the subsidy removal, is financial inclusion. Critical to make sure that people actually have the benefit of financial, social, financial inclusion, and a lot of corruption actually can disappear by the same token. Can I, 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 before we move on, I, I just want to say a couple words on financial reform, because I, I don't think it's a fair characterization to, think, to say nothing has changed since 2008. Look, we have re, we're working to recenter finance as a servant as, of the real economy. It's its, it's rightful role. They, uh, financial institutions may have spent a lot of money lobbying they wasted a lot of money lobbying. Capital requirements for financial institutions for banks have increased 10 times um, since uh, the financial crisis. Um, we have worked uh, to put in place mechanisms to end too big to fail. Perceptions matter. One of the big issues is the fairness of the system. It's, Oxfam rightly draws attention to this in their report. But the subsidy there has come down. And it's a subsidy, this uh, implicit subsidy from us to banks, come down from about 130 billion in the UK sterling to about 30 billion today. We're looking to eliminate it by changing things. The other aspects that have to change, though, is the effectiveness of markets, the fairness of markets, um, allusions to the scandals, I think, in your uh, initial um, uh, element. And, there, and there's, there's, there's some reality there. And part of the way we get at that goes to your pay for performance, which is performance in all senses of the word, not short term returns but whether there's excessive risk taking and, very importantly, whether conduct is appropriate. So we're putting in place new structures for pay so that pay can be taken back from those 
who took excessive risks or certainly who contributed to any of these types of scandals. And that's essential to get fairness back in the system, to build trust. It's not, as, as Bob Schiller said, it's not all the answer, but it's part of the answer. Well, I'm, I'm encouraged because we've had a lot of ideas. We've had financial reform talked about. We've had a very specific idea about uh, insurance, which would help those at the bottom end. We've had Martin Sorrell's six-point plan. It's Rick Salmon's. Can I come um, back on taxation? Winning. I want to come back. You see, this 50% at the bottom that we talk about that has the same wealth as the 80 at the top, who are they? They are 90% of them are people in Africa, in Latin America, in some Asian countries. They are from poor, developing countries. And who is the 1%? 70% of the 1% are rich people in the northern countries. Now, if you look at these developing countries, they are also the same countries that are exporting commodities, many of them. And we know that $100 billion is lost to these countries every year through tax dodging and unhealthy tax competition. So unless we fix the global tax rules so that these countries can collect what is due to them, they're not going to be able to lift their people out of poverty. So we need to fix the global tax rules. Christine Lagarde, you might be, have a role in that, coordinating things potentially. Go on, what do you we think actually, about? We actually do, and we provide a lot of the developing countries with technical assistance in order to reform their tax regime, in order to improve their collection of revenues, and in order to be more transparent about the relationship that they have with the purchases of those commodities, because uh, there is leakage, there is base erosion, there is profit optimization going on that often is detrimental to the uh, low-income countries that are providing those commodities. But it's not, you know, I would agree with um, Professor Schiller, it's, it's complicated. It's not, it has to be done, it has to be improved, but it's a complicated matter and there are no sort of, you know, black and white solution. It has to be really done properly. But to win his point, through to 2030, the rise in the middle class in the BRICS, despite some of the current difficulties, short-term difficulties, I believe, that some of those BRICS have, the, the forecasts are that the middle classes and poverty level, middle classes will rise, poverty levels will fall, and general wealth will fall. The problem will be not so much in those fast growth markets, and you saw it a little bit in your film clips, the problem will be in Western Europe, in France and Italy and Spain, because that's where the unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, is so high. And ironically, that's not gonna be the issue in, by 2030. I think Martin and Winnie are both doing good things in different spheres. You are helping produce wealth. You are helping deal with a fundamental human problem that if I don't see for poor people, I blank them out. If you were walking down the street found a star, anyone here I assume, walking down the street found a starving child, you would help. Well, you know there are people like that to help, but you don't see them. So what Oxfam does is it brings that to our attention. And I, I think it's a, a force for the good. Yes, one out of nine people in the world today will go to bed hungry tonight. That's not right, it shouldn't happen. One billion people still live on less than a dollar a day. That shouldn't be. We can't just keep saying that there's a growing middle class when there's one billion people in a world full of riches that are hungry and are living Desperate lives. But Winnie, what, what, does the, what do those figures mean to you about the very large reduction in the proportion of the world living in poverty? I mean, do you recognise that that is a system that needs you to see, be preserved and just nudged? Or do you see that it's a system that needs to be overthrown? Does it not? No, I'm not ideological. I'm not against capitalism or even against communism. I'm just looking for solutions that will give mm. everyone in the world a decent life. And we know there are solutions. We know there are solutions in fair, taxation and spending, if that can happen, if we can have a global system of rules that enable that, that will help us. If we can plow resources into education and health, we know that works. That is a virtual income to the poor. It lifts people out of poverty. We want those solutions. Klaus Kleinfeld, you said you're not an expert on tax. How big a part does tax play in the business decisions that you make? If we put taxes up on your company, 
Would it damage the output, the employment, all the things we uh, might like? Alcoa just celebrated its 125th anniversary last year. You know, in many of the businesses, when we invest, we stay there for the next 100 years. I mean, we make decisions today that impact communities uh, over a very, very long term. I mean, tax policy usually is very, very volatile. If I make a decision and base it purely on tax policy, I would not do a but, good but job. But we have you to know? be honest and say it does influence it very significantly. So to win his point, to get change, you have to have coordinated policy. Well, you can't, it can't be a race to the bottom. I mean, for example, in the UK, one of the reasons that the UK economy has been so effective and efficient, and George has done such a good job as CFO of the UK economy, is because the tax rate is internationally highly competitive. But I think that's, that's the point. It has to be competitive. And I think we're well, talking about in a flat world, in a flat world what, what you really have to do is you have to have a tax policy where you have a level playing but, field. But you that's, know as that's well as I do, important. Klaus, that in America, the US companies complain that their tax rates are too high. That, and that is true. Yeah. But let me say this. Very briefly. For the, for the companies here, that I come to, tell, to give them uncomfortable messages. If pharmaceutical companies are putting $50 million every year here in Europe to lobby. What are they lobbying about? It's mainly about taxation. It's so that they can get away with little taxation. So let, let them stop lobbying. Why must they keep lobbying? Okay. Let them put the money in medicine. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> let's... Um... Let's, uh, we, we do need to move on, because we've got so much to talk about. We've had lots and lots of different ideas, and often the debate on equality is uh, thought about the fact that we don't hear very much about what one might do about it. We've had plenty uh, to go away and chew on. I want us to move on to a brief final section here to talk about whether our system is inexorably driving us to more inequality or potentially less through technology. So here's the basic question. Is the internet, and all that goes with it, is that a force for redistribution or for allowing the haves to have yet more. Now, we asked Tim Berners-Lee, who's the inventor of the World Wide Web, for a view, and he warned that a large chunk of the world's population is being left behind. To a certain extent, the original vision of the web was that it should be something where individuals, citizens, consumers participate. The web seems, on the face of it, to be a tremendous equalizing measure, and it's often hailed as being something which breaks down national boundaries, allows anybody co to connect. So let's think about that for a moment. First of all, when we think about anybody can connect, we're actually a minority of people. Around 40% of people in the world use the web at all. So for the other 60%, in fact, every time the power of the web increases, every time it's possible to do more things online, then actually those 60% are left further behind. So to a certain extent, while the web is still only available to 40% of the people in the world, it is increasing the, uh, the gap between the, have, uh, the haves and the have-nots. Tim Berners-Lee there. Well, the web obviously has some beneficial effects in reducing concentrations of wealth and power. It increases competition, it improves education and the transmission of information, but it might give more help to those who have the best access. And of course, it does threaten jobs and disruption often to those already struggling. So good effects and then bad for the next uh, five minutes. Um, Klaus Kleinfeld, I'm interested in your take on whether technology and the way it impacts, say, your company, whether that is, if you like, diffusing economic power or whether that's concentrating it. And the answer is it does both. I mean, in, in a way, technology has really made the world very flat. It's, it's, it's a digitization of things, right? I mean, uh, Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world, and we see that, at, we see that everywhere. I mean, you, I, I've also pulled up some data here on, 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 uh, also on the rest of the world. I mean, if you look at mobile cellular subscription, I mean, from 2005, 1.2 billion of uh, people in the rest of the world has exit. Now it's 5.1 billion people. And when you look at what happens when farmers get their hands around simply a cell phone that has access to market information. I mean, the, the average income increases. Sri Lanka, 23%, India, 19%, Uganda, 15%, Peru, 13%. So that's great. When you go to the, to the developed world, you see another phenomenon. You see, for instance, if you pick out the job of a call center, which can be done, as we all know, anywhere in the world. I mean, the cost of that is, uh, is, is in the US, it's $81,000 a year. And in India, it's $43,000 a year. So guess what's going to happen, right? So it's clear. It's going to it has both effects. Yeah. Bob Schiller. I think we're living at a time of panic about artificial intelligence, not just the internet. Think of it more broadly. 
in, and I think we're panicked by new things that are scaring us about our jobs in the future. Siri came out in 2011, that's about four years ago, with a, with a cell phone that talks, answers your questions. I now have one. I turned it off in my pocket. But I could say, OK, Google, what should we do about inequality? And a voice would come out of my pocket <laughs> that would join into this conversation. It wouldn't be as bright as yours, though, Robin. But uh, I mean, the point is that people are scared, and they are right to be scared. We don't know where this is going. Artificial intelligence is coming, and it will replace your job, or it will at least bring you in competition. And it's not, it's not only your artificial I mean, it's 3D printing, robotics we see in the Alcoa manufacturing process. We don't know, to Robert's point, and we don't know in, in our industry too, how, much, how many jobs are created or not. One point, I hesitate to disagree with Berners -Lee, Tim Berners-Lee, but take Egypt, for example, which we were discussing last night. 44% internet penetration, 115% penetration on mobile. The difference is the smartphone, China, 475 million exactly. smartphones. The difference is the smartphone, Xiaomi, $45 billion of value after four years. Th these things are changing for everyone. Grameen Bank built on the those telephone women that rented out phones. Mobile technology is fundamentally changing the way and altering supply chains and legacy businesses in a very threatening way. OK, we've got a tweet uh, making the point that robotics lead to capital-intensive production exactly. and then unemployment, and tech uh, thus drives inequality. Mm. Winnie, are you as pessimistic about technology as that? No, I'm not. One, the potential of technology to give a good life to everyone, lift people from poverty is enormous. We work in many countries around the world using technology to help poor people find solutions. One of the proudest projects, one of the projects I'm proudest of is a project that gives young people post-crisis coming out of war in northern Uganda opportunity to access global markets through the internet doing some outsourcing work for companies in America. That's great. But we have to understand that today, people are dying from Ebola. There's no vaccine for Ebola. Malaria is still killing millions of people. It could be treated. And why? Because there's an over-reliance on intellectual property for, for research and development in technology. If we can put research and technology more as a public good and have investments by governments for the development of technologies that can empower people, then we are on track. But when it's driven by private interests and intellectual property uh, rights, it doesn't lift people from poverty. I think, you, I think you've been a little more pessimistic than I was expecting about technology, if I'm honest. Let's get the, the, the mood of the hall here. Let me just ask a very simple binary question. New technology, is it going to create jobs over the next 20 years or is it going to destroy jobs over the next 20 years? How many of you think it will create jobs? And how many of you think it will destroy jobs? I would say that was about uh, three quarters, one do, quarter. How many don't know? Three quarters. We haven't time for the don't know, Martin. Three quarters think it will create, will create jobs. OK, let me go back to Mike, because we are time. We are now sort of wrapping up. First of all, Mark Carney, are you... Pessimistic on technology, because of course technology in the past has tended to create as many jobs as it destroys. No, I'm 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 an optimist on technology. I'm not a secular stagnationist, if you will, in that in that sense of the word. But the disruption element is 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 very large here, um, and there will be a period of adjustment. And so picking 20 years is actually quite helpful. If if your question was in the next five, it'd be much more difficult. Let me make a couple points on technology. Um, first, we should recognize, actually, some of the biggest. Um, the uh, firms that take most advantage of international tax rules are technology companies. <laughs> the amount of tax that's actually paid by technology companies is very small relative to the returns. Mm. Um, so that IP, and, and so a sense of responsibility for the system, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I would point to that. Um, two, uh, two final points on technology. The first is that, as Robert Schiller uh, alludes to, uh, artificial intelligence, it's not even just the intelligence, it's actually the algorithmic power of uh, the ability to, for technology to displace very 
um, what we see as cognitive jobs today, but actually everything I did at Goldman Sachs actually can be replaced by technology, um, which, which tells you something, um, which is why I had to leave. Um, and, um, uh, um, there's some who think everything I do today would be better uh, replaced by technology. But the, uh, the point being that it, in, that dis, in that disruption, a series of sort of, quote, white collar, middle class jobs, um, people have to improve their skills to move to the higher creativity jobs. A lot of them in the interim, this is the job polarization point, compete. Uh, they're overskilled for the jobs they compete. And that helps keep wages down. So the issue becomes, how do you have education? How do you have lifelong learning? How do you have training? Uh, so you, for a world where we're actually creating an opportunity for uh, mass creativity, those are the types of jobs we'll ultimately need, but it's, it's going to take a while to get from here to, to there. We've just got 90 seconds left. I want to, if you like, wrap up the whole debate with you, Christine Lagarde. Um, it feels like there's been a big shift in the intellectual climate in the last five or ten years. We talked about that at the beginning. Do you think there's a political will? Well, to grab some of the issues that we've talked about, perhaps think about, do some of the policies that we discussed? You know, if, if I can move the IMF in the direction of looking as, at inequality as main, mainstream and core business, if the Republican Party in the United States is now looking at inequality as an issue, as was reported in the New York Times this morning, then certainly there is a shift, and we have to take advantage of that shift in order to make sure that what is excessive becomes sensible, reasonable, and conducive to good creation of market value, to good creation of jobs, and to a bit more fairness around the world. 20 seconds. Were you excited by President Obama's State of the Union message on Monday? If you can implement half of it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the tax stuff, the tax stuff? Half of it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, look, we've had a very interesting debate. Sometimes these issues are always far more complicated than you'd like them to be, far more complicated than the public would like uh, them to be. But we do now need uh, to bring a close to our debate today. Uh, of course, the conversation can continue. You might want to follow up some of the points you've, uh, some of you heard. You can continue the conversation online, in homes and in workplaces around the world. But let me say a very heartfelt thank you to all of you who've contributed your thoughts and questions. There's some more tweets I could have read. Uh, thank you to our global audience around the world, on television, radio and online. And of course, above all, uh, thanks to our panel here. But that is all from the World Debate in Davos. From me, Evan Davis, goodbye.